So I thought I would start this with a, a little bit of motivation as to how I came to be interested in, in this particular topic. And uh, it all kind of started with some driving questions that sort of bug it at me uh, constantly as, I, as I'm thinking about math and thinking about what we teach. And those questions are really, uh, why don't more people use or see math in their daily lives? Why is it so hard to transfer mathematical knowledge? And if it's so hard to transfer and people don't see the math that we teach them in their daily lives, why do we even teach it at all? That's not to say that math isn't worth teaching. It's just what is it about math that makes it worth teaching? And I, I guess that's probably where I start with this all. What is it about math that, that we really want students to get? And, and I think that the things we want are the, the deeper problem-solving skills, the understanding, the, the ways of thinking that go along with math, and the skills we teach them are ways to get at that. And I think you can see that in, in some documents like the Common Core Standards, which talk at the beginning about mathematical understanding, and also students understand mathematics if they can explain things, uh, and if they can explain things, then perhaps they're, they're more likely to transfer that knowledge. And that goes back to the, the second question that I had in, on the previous slide. So what are these, this problem solving or this, this mathematical thinking or this understanding that we want to get at? And sticking with the Common Core Standards for a second, they uh, break it down into these standards for mathematical practice. These are all the, the standards that are supposed to cut through everything we teach in mathematics. And this is what I kind of think as, as, as one way of framing what it means to, to be mathematical, or to think mathematically. And in this presentation, there's a couple of them which I want to focus on uh, heavily. Specifically, making sense of problems and persevering in solving them, and modeling with mathematics. The question is, why is this important? And, and I think the reason that this is important is because there, there's a disconnect between what we teach in school and the real math that people use. The research has found, uh, first, that there's a mismatch between what is taught and what professionals do. So if you look at take a survey of the types of math that professional, you know, professionals with STEM degrees, uh, what they do in their field is uh, not very similar, not in similar in many ways to what we teach them in typical classrooms. To go along with that, we have that in the real world, the math that we teach is seldom used. Uh, what happens, what the research has found, is that people encounter math and they develop routines or algorithms or, or uh, ways of solving these problems and they sort of commit those those algorithms or those routines to memory or, or become good at them or whatever whatever it takes for them and then that's what they use all right and then the last thing is that the professionals who do use math uh, they don't always recognize the math that they use uh, one survey they asked physics majors uh, physics grads what they what were the most useful things they got from their degree and 60 percent of those surveyed said that solving problem solving interpersonal skills technical writing and management were more important than the physics than the actual physics or math content that they used. Continue on, Duke, Grow, and Allen, who piloted a, a problem-solving initiative at the University of Delaware, they referenced the uh, these characteristics of quality college grads, which came out of a, a workshop and are meant to, you know, describe the important things that someone should get from a STEM degree. Those are all great skills, and I don't think anyone would disagree that those are important for people to have. The question is, are students getting those skills from the math that we're teaching them? I think that it's hard to make the case that the traditional way that we teach math is teaching kids these skills in a direct, uh, in a direct way. So the question is, how do we teach these skills? What do we do to get students uh, to be able to do this kind of thing. And for me, I think the first place to look is in, is in problem solving. And there's been a lot of lot done on problem solving <clears throat> and how to teach kids to problem solve, because really that's what we want. We want kids to be able to solve problems flexibly uh, and in new situations to be able to apply the skills they've learned, because uh, if they can't apply the skills in problem solving, then really those skills aren't aren't worth a whole lot. So research in problem solving has focused on three different things. First of all, they focused on problem solving strategies. Maybe if we break down problem solving into strategies, we can teach those strategies to students and then they'll be better problem solvers. Another, another approach to problem solving is to look at metacognitive processes. So that's, we look at expert mathematicians, expert scientists, and we say, how do they approach problems? What, what do they think about? What do they do when they go through problems? And can we teach kids to replicate 
those can we teach students to replicate those metacognitive processes? And I guess the last thing is is sort of a rephrasing both of the previous ones, calling it habits of mind. These all seem like really great approaches, but uh, according to Lesh and Zobajewski, at least, these none of these have really panned out. So problem solving in in problem solving strategies tend to uh, be very problem specific and student specific. So if you're going to compile a list of problem solving strategies, you're going to end up with a very long list, or you're going to end up with a very general list, and that very general list might be nice in categorizing strategies, but it's not going to be very useful as far as solving problems. The metacognitive processes uh, are interesting because teaching kids to replicate those uh, metacognitive processes has does not necessarily translate into uh, problem solving success. And the last thing is habits of mind, which is, is very similar to the previous two. So we want to teach problem solving, uh, trying to understand problem solving in these, from this perspective hasn't really panned out as much as we might like. So what, what do we do? Well, my personal perspective on it comes from constructivism. Constructivism in itself is, is a great philosophy on learning, but how do you make it, how do you attach it to practice, or how do you build a constructivist classroom or constructivist activities? And uh, Savory and Duffy in 2001 came up with a really nice paper on marrying constructivist theory and practice. And uh, they had these three overarching themes those three general themes are a nice way to sum up in, in one way constructivism but also three important things to consider when you're trying to uh, build a classroom around this. So they went on then to define six instructional principles that can be used to build constructivist activities within the classroom. One way that they discuss that's very successful in embodying these instructional principles is the idea of problem-based learning. So problem-based learning has its origins with uh, Barrows in, in medical education, and it, it's met with a lot of success, and, and a lot of medical education programs are built on it. The basic tenet of this is that it brings the problem to the forefront. Traditionally, you'll in math, you'll, you'll learn skills and abstract concepts, and then once you've learned those skills, you apply them to real-world problems. Okay, But what problem-based learning does is, is it sort of flips this around. And instead of starting with the skills, you start with the rich, open-ended problems. And then in, in attacking the problem and trying to figure out a solution to the problem, you develop the skills and knowledge necessary. Uh, Duke, and, uh, Grow, and Allen summed it up very nicely, I thought, describing how the problems can be used to motivate the students to uh, research the concepts and, uh, and identify what they need to know on their own. The question remains, how do we approach or how do we investigate problem-based learning and this constructivist classroom from a research perspective. So for this, I, I'm, I, I'm adopting the models and modeling perspective, <clears throat> which uh, has been written about a lot by Lesh, uh, but specifically by Lesh and Dora from 2003 in Beyond Constructivism. So the focus on a models and modeling perspective is on not necessarily on the solution to the problem or the problem solving strategy that the person does that the student does but on the interpretation of the problem so uh, according to Lesh in in several different papers the the reason that problem solving heuristics and, and strategies aren't effective as uh, learning tools is, is because they're only useful once you've learned to interpret the problem so you read a, a realistically complex problem and or or hear or are proposed, presented with a realistic complex problem, and none of those strategies will help you until you are able to interpret that problem as as a math problem. So, in the models and modeling perspective, the focus is on how students interpret problems. Uh, and then, this definition of models, which I, I like and it's important, is that a model is a is useful simplification. This is a, a slightly different approach to problem solving than the traditional approach, uh, the model and modeling approach, and here's a graphic which you'll notice is very similar to the problem-based learning theme. We have in traditional problem solving, uh, applied problems are a subset, but from the models and modeling perspective, uh, applied problem solving is really the problem solving that we want to do. Uh, we're constantly modeling, and then the traditional problem solving that we teach kids is a subset of the, the uh, real problems that we encounter all the time.
Okay. So models and modeling perspective uh, fits very nicely with our idea of problem-based learning and uh, a constructivist classroom in, because it, it subscribes, uh, the authors admit that it subscribes, it's very similar to a constructivist and socio-cultural epistemology. Uh, within the models and modeling perspective, the focus is on developing tools, developing tools to help teachers, to help researchers, and to help students. And the most important part, at least for me, is that learning, teaching, and theory, they all develop in parallel. So as we learn about how students think about how students develop their models, uh, we modify the teaching that we do to better suit their models. And in turn, we can affect their learning, and we can also affect the theory of how they learn uh, some specific topic. So this models and modeling perspective provides not only a, a theory of instruction, or a theory of research, but a theory of instruction too. So I like that about it as well. Uh, and the focus is on the response uh, to the problems, and that's how the student approaches, the, by response I mean how the student approaches the problem, uh, how, what they choose to do to attack the problem. And uh, I think it's important, before we go too much further, to discuss a, a model, a modeling cycle. And uh, the modeling cycle starts with the real world. And once we see a real world problem, then we have to come up with some sort of description of that. And that, that's describing it mathematically. And that's the, the key point, is being able to take the real world and come up with some sort of mathematical description. That mathematical description is a model. And then once we have the model, we manipulate the model for whatever purpose we have, whether we want to make predictions, whether we want to look for patterns, <clears throat> whatever we're doing, we want to make that model. So we manipulate the model, uh, we change the model, and then we, we come up with some, some prediction, and we test that prediction back against the real world, and that's the verification stage. Now, in a traditional story problem setting, instead of starting in the real world and finishing in the real world, the, the story already ends up in the model world and it basically stays in the model world uh, unless the the student wants to at the end do what we sometimes call sanity check and check their answer against the real world so in that case perhaps the the ambitious student might venture along the bottom half of this cycle but not the entire thing uh, as Helen Dorr put it uh, in a traditional story problem we want to unmask the math hidden in the problem but in a modeling problem, we want to represent and make sense of a real situation mathematically. <clears throat> All right, so the way to go about this, uh, according to the models and modeling perspective, is through model eliciting activities. Well, one of the ways is through model eliciting activities. And these are open-ended, realistically complex problems where the product uh, is a reusable model. And an example is the Bigfoot MEA, and, and this one is, uh, is where students are challenged with a, with a problem of they have a bunch of footprints and they have to figure out a, a way of determining the height of a person based on those footprints uh, and that particular MEA if it hits on ideas as portionality and, and data analysis uh, and linear relationships we have uh, some principles, some important principles of designing an MEA. So, and this really not only tells you how to design an MEA, but tells you what an MEA is. Uh, <clears throat> so the first thing is that MEA must include model construction. So some part of the problem must be the construction of a model. Uh, the the problems must be reality, based in reality in some way. Now, uh, the phrase I love from Lesh is uh, realistically complex. Now, it doesn't mean that the, the problem is real, it just means that it's realistic, and it's realist in, realistic in its complexity. Uh, it has to have built in some form of self-assessment. There has to be some form of documentation. Uh, it has to be shareable and reusable. And this last point, effective prototype. Effective prototype means that the it has to be uh, it has to hit on a big idea. It has to boil down to an important concept in math. Uh, otherwise, it, it it will be a lot of time spent on something that's not uh, something that kids are going to go back on or lean lean on in the future when they are developing and evolving their models.